Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Um, welcome to PNCA and the Halley Ford School of Graduate Studies Lecture Series. I'm Sarah Houston, the chair of the MFA in Applied Craft and Design. Um, and I have a first year student here up here with me, and we're going to kind of go back and forth in introduction and, and sharing the stage here. So I'd like to um, welcome Raz, Raz Mari, Raz Mari, first year Fulbright student um, within ACB. And Raz is going to introduce the guests tonight. So I'm going to hand the microphone on over. Thank you. Um, so before we begin, I would like to honor the indigenous people whose traditional ancestral homelands we stand on and occupy. The Multnomah, Klamath, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala, Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is essential to be aware of this place, ancestors, and recognize the sacrifices and displacement forced upon the indigenous nations of this region and across the country. It is vital that we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants, past, present, and the future. A land acknowledgement is a critical step towards working with native communities to secure meaningful partnerships and inclusion in the stewardship and protection of their cultural resources and homelands. Let's take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that we are collectively gathered upon and support the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have shown worldwide. I hope that when we all leave today, we put these words into action so that these words do not become empty sentiments, but instead responsibility, reciprocity, respect, and meaningful relationships. So tonight's lecture is hosted by the program that I'm chair of, the MFA in Applied Craft and Design. And it's part of Portland Textile Month, which maybe some of you in the audience have had a chance to attend some of the other events and stuff. Um, it's also part of the Halley Ford School of Graduate Studies. Um, join us, so we have another lecture coming up after this, so join us for the next lecture, co-sponsored by Stello Arts and hosted by the Visual Studies Program, um, Astria Suprak, um, on November 16th um, at 6.30, and so. I'm gonna pass it back to Raz here and to introduce Jean Medina Lee, Lay. So Jean Medina Lay received her BFA in Fiber and Material Studies and post Bac in Fashion, Body and Garment from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and her MFA in Fiber from Cranbrook Academy of Art where she was awarded the Toby Devon Lewis Award. The award enabled her to pursue research in Antwerp, Belgium at the Mode Museum and to work with fashion designer Christian Wynots. In 2018, she was awarded the, Foundation the Fountainhead Fellowship in Craft and Material Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. There, she worked with the Highland Su Support Project and Fair Trade Weaving Organization, Pichon, in Sheila, Guatemala, to develop textile designs with indigenous Mayan weavers. Her collaborations include a 2019 Bessie Award winning project with choreographer Nija Whitson. She has been artist in residence at Haystack Mountain School of Crafts, Caldera, Oak Spring Garden Foundation, and Pine Meadow Ranch. Jean served as a visiting assistant professor in fibers at Oregon College of Art and Craft in Portland, Oregon. Her exhibitions include interpreti interpretive center and body textile solo exhibition at the Alice Gallery in Seattle, Garb at the Art Center Pasadena, International Fiber Art Fair in Seoul, Korea, Ancestral Offering Soul Exhibition at Reynolds Gallery in Richmond, Virginia, and Discursive at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum in Eugene, Oregon. Her work is in the permanent collection of Cranbrook Art Museum in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, and the Oak Spring Garden Foundation. Rachel Bunny Mellon Collection in Upperville, Virginia. Jean is currently assistant professor in 3D Media and Fibers Program, head at California State University, Long Beach. Help me in welcoming Jean to PNCA.
Thank you, Raz, for the very lovely introduction. Um, and thank you, Sarah Houston, for um, um, and the um, Applied Craft and Design Program for, for having me here today. It's been really lovely meeting all of you and seeing all the work you're doing. Um, so thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? No? Okay. Mm -hmm. How about now? A little more? 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 Better? Okay, cool. All right, here we go. Um, so before we get started, um, I'd like to warn you that this is not a tidy presentation. I don't move chronologically or procedurally through ideas. Um, but rather, there's an emergence of projects in relation to ideas and encounters. I used to feel like this diagram was a really good way of describing my process, um, something that traveled along an X and a Y axis. Textile, performance, garment, installation. But the deeper I go, the more I realize it probably looks something more like this diagram. It's messier, right? And it has more dimension. And each of these layers would be like a project, or as um, Reza Nagaristani calls it, a wonder zone. And the holes are these like ideas or treasure chambers. And the threads and the dotted lines are the connections that th flow through the projects. But even still, this one might capture it even better, right? So like, here's a diagram of a feedback spiral, which seems to capture the thought process even more closely of this like entanglement and this continuous process that's always doubling back onto itself. So the work embodies a relational process that emerges through sensing and feeling. What I hope you will see is that the work itself is emerging out of the surround. Some of it will sound really abstract, and that's okay. What's more important is that if it moves you, that you'll travel with it. I'm currently following a process philosophy course with Dr. Aaron Manning at Concordia University in Montreal to study what Edward Bissant calls the opaque in his book, A Poetics of Relation. Aaron opens the course by stating that the opaque is the relational, the poetics that insist that there be a consent not to be a single being. What is it to make sense in this poetics of feeling? Feeling in process philosophy is not subjective. It is not what a subject does. Feeling is what propels subjectivity into act. To have a world motored by feeling is arguably to displace the transparency of a colonial project, to shift the contours of what has been made to count. So when I say that the making process is one of embodiment, the body and the materials organize themselves through technique. But when I look back at the work, and when I really look, I find that it's showing me all of the questions that I need to ask of the world. Like, what are we doing with the earth? And, and how do we tend to the horror of our environment? And how has being human served us? How are we supporting an ecology which emancipates and empowers in a relation of encounters with each other and the world? To imagine the transparency of relation is also to justify the opacity of what impels it. The sacred is of us, of this network, of our wandering, our errantry. One of my greatest assets is my material somatic knowledge, knowing with my hands, my skin, my senses. I try to learn the space of the body, both physical and psychological, through textile production, garment manipulation, and performance. The culmination of these experiences enables me to develop models of operation, processes, and build a network of resources in order to realize larger projects and collaborations. At this capacity, my role as an artist is to construct a different kind of fabric, one of ideas and people. I become the thread, mediator, connector, facilitator. I can only know the space of cloth through my haptic experience, 
through habitation of a garment, I understand it as true interior space. A void that when occupied becomes a third kind of space, that of the other. This is where interiority meets exteriority. In my work body object studies, I use dance to activate the internal space of a garment. The concrete geometry of the circular garment collapsed when introduced to my body. It became an animated other in response to its movement. Discovering the interior, in effect, reshapes the exterior body space horizon line, the visible, the outward worlding. The space of the silhouette is the third space of the body, the index, the shadow space, the void. In Felt Fractal, I document my experience of navigating the space of a textile to imagine myself as a thread moving through the shed of a warp, or what it feels like to be entangled in a knot. From this, I can imagine the space around the body in which to build and occupy. Through mediation, I wanted to turn the video itself into another textile that was constantly unfolding and fracturing. It is a proposal for a more open and virtual vision of a bodily state, one that is multiplicitous and already always shifting. At another level, I try to understand the space of the body through manipulating garment patterns. In the flat to form studies, I ba based on Buckminster Fuller's architectural triangulation, I used equilateral triangles to construct garments that followed a structure of logic independent of the body, but for the body. The process allowed for the accordion-like compression of fabric, which when expanded, created structural versatility and possibility for an ever-changing silhouette. It raised the questions, what are the possibilities for its occupation? Must a garment's utility have a determinate life, or can it serve many functions, such as garment, shelter, or aesthetic object? The garments request a connection with the subject to explore them, to know them, and to constantly look for multiple ways of inhabiting them. Errantry. That is very much the image of the rhizome, prompting the knowledge that identity is no longer completely in the root, but also in relation because the thought of errantry is also the thought of what is relative, the thing relayed as well as the thing related. The thought of errantry is a poetic, which at some moment always infers that it is told. The tale of errantry is a tale of relation. Dr. Janice Cephas's research on the urbanization of Detroit in the early 20th century had a major influence in bringing my awareness to my body in relation to craft production especially in a city of lost industry and black community. She was particularly interested in examining the metaphors associated with working class bodies, modern buildings, and efficient machines. As the capital of the post-industrial world, Detroit became well known for its vacancy and urban ruins. This is an image from the demolition of Detroit City Hall in 1961. It was one of many significant demolitions which factored into the local discourses concerning the city's declining population, lost industry, and dilapidated architecture. Jenna read the demolition sites to study what might be found in place of architectural absence, namely the absent presence of histories and social memories past that in turn are integral to city making. On March 10th, 2013, during the daylight savings performance, I attempted to address site as material I sought to actively engage my audience in their encounter of the work and open a dialogue with the place. I invited collaboration with Wayne State University dancers, videographer John Lee, and music collaborator Maya Sems to realize the project. I see place not as a geographical condition, but as an occurrence between human and non-human. I needed to clear out a space for the viewer, physical and psychological, to encounter the performance. The audience was engaged as participants, collaborators, and were led through a one-mile walk down a greenway along a repurposed industrial corridor called the Dequinder Cut. Working with the dancers, we created movement phrases derived from the weaving process. The Global Trading Company, 
a derelict building at the international border between Michigan and Canada was encountered at the end of the cut. The site became the warp, which the dancers engaged as the weft. The garments, like the site, became the framework for physical and emotional entanglement. I wanted you. And I was looking for you. But I couldn't find you. I wanted you. And I was looking for you all day. But I couldn't find you. I couldn't find you. You're walking, and you don't always realize it, but you're always falling. With each step, you fall forward slightly, and then catch yourself from falling over and over you're falling and then catching yourself from falling and this is how you can be walking and falling at the same time So the soundtrack is uh, Laurie Anderson's Walking and Falling, and um, part of the project was to um, reach out to um, other artists, um, such as Laurie Anderson, and, and ask her to sort of um, to be a collaborator in this project, and we asked her if we could use her, um, her sound piece as the soundtrack for this, and, and she agreed, and so, um, so we're super grateful to her for that. So while teaching at OCAC, I taught the graduate seminar with Carl Berkheimer on the topic of the provisional. In January 2019, we led the students on a trip to Wendover, a city that sits on the border of Nevada and Utah, and was the site of a now abandoned military airstrip. The city also sits on the edge of the Bonneville Salt Flats. 26,000 acres of salt flats where land speed records are measured and made. It's also where the Enola Gay trained before dropping the atom bomb on Japan in 1945. Nearby are several site-specific land artworks, including Spiral Jetty by Robert Smithson and Sun Tunnels by Nancy Holt. The Great Salt Lake, which is on the eastern border of this great stretch of salty space, is at its lowest point it ever has been. And according to NPR, one of the biggest worries is that the Great Salt Lake will go the way others have gone before it, not just drying up and ceasing to be a source of water, but becoming a source of poison. Biologist Bonnie Baxter says that more than 40% of the lake bed is no longer covered by water and could turn to dust. In visiting these two earthworks, I was thinking about the idea of provisionality, not in the sense of the, like, of provisional painting, which specifically addresses the non-essential nature of skill and craft within a painting, nor in the casualist, as, uh, casualist sense in which a painting might appear unfinished or incomplete, but more in the literal adjective sense of being arranged or existing for the present, possibly to be changed later. Because the earth changes and is indeed changing, Smithson practiced an explicit complicity with geologic time, the provisional nature of working with material. Nancy Holt's sun tunnel is truly in the middle of vast space, 
a perfect horizon where you are surrounded by earth and sky. As one moves through the concrete pipes, the gaze is directed to look at the landscape, but also the cosmos. As I was looking about, as I was thinking um, and looking and kind of thinking about framing and like contextualizing and pointing toward and like how a work can point outwardly into the imperceptible and ineffable. When the only context is the vastness of the earth, it is easy to observe that per perception itself is praxis. Opening to the poetic relation between the human and non-human is a skill or practice that is already moving, worlding, and languaging in the surround. It's an act, embracing the unknowable and also surrendering to being poorest within it. So these were these like crystals that were growing on the carcasses of birds that were on the salt bed, like salt flats. Um, and um, we started picking them up and, 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 and making sound with them. So as an artist, I'm becoming more entangled and my practice complicated by a complicity with the earth and a necessary politicization. As artists considering processes such as the geologic that are bigger than any cultural practice, we, we become aware that we are already in a poetics of relation. We consent not to be a single being. Engaging in this kind of relational, porous, and rhizomic practice enables other ways of being which can only exist outside the construct of colonial whiteness. It's an emancipation of the individual into an emergent sociality, a relation uncountable and a more than the sum of its parts. If we tune into this relation in all its senses, telling, listening, connecting, and the parallel consciousness to self and surroundings, we open ourselves to an immense opportunity, not only to our work as artists and thinkers, but for facilitating an ecology of encounter to shift perspectives and imagine new ways of being. Recent research regarding the significance and consequence of anthropogenic changes in the Earth's land, ocean, biosphere, and climate have demonstrated that, from a wide range of scientific research positions, it is probable to conclude that humans have entered a new geologic epoch, their own. And if it's difficult to imagine, it's because the concept creates a distortion of human scale, a decentralization in perceiving geologic time. It's a structural blindness in which we can't access this part of our own reality because the process exceeds our human capacity to witness it. This is a drawing by Jimmy Durham from the second particle wave theory in 2005 and was used by Dr. Etienne Turpin to, Turpin to illustrate the idea of structural blindness. So like there's this like giant mass and like we're the house below and we're like, hmm, I hope it's just a cloud and not a meteor. Um, so in how societies remember, Paul Connerton describes two kinds of bodily practices in which memory is sedimented or amassed in the body. One is an incorporating practice, messages or transmissions imparted by means of bodily activity in presence of each other, a smile, a handshake, or words spoken in presence of someone. The transmission occurs only during the time that their bodies are present to sustain that particular activity. The other is an inscribing practice. This includes all of our modern devices for storing and retrieving information, computers, print, indexes, photos, sound recordings, all require that we do something that traps and holds information long after the human organism has stopped informing. The Project S was a collaboration with Javencio de la Paz, Chase Henson, Sarah Huerta, and Katie Wood. We set a 12 foot by 12 foot stage of salt. The letter S represented the salt 
but also the mathematical symbol for the thermodynamic law of entropy. A soundtrack of static played off an old weather radio worn as a mask. I wore the garment, I made the garments, and stood in attendance at the border of the salt canvas. The participants performed a series of movements based on the actions of incorporating and inscribing. The performance came to a conclusion as the salt was swept away. In convergent dimensions, I was trying to make with short-term memory, collaborating with forgetting. In essence, instead of centralizing my practice in one site, I wanted to erase the context and to make room to describe my own territory. This process of entropy, reducing the world, limiting, focusing, letting even the materials forget themselves, eventually allowed me to reintroduce the context, that of the performance space. Maya Sems curated a playlist of music based on her interpretation of my work. While in the studio, I worked to the playlist over and over, and eventually translating the music into weavings through codified blocks of material and sensations. I invited Aaron Fitzsiegel to remix the playlist into a soundscape to which choreographer Biba Bell developed movement phrases based on the process of weaving. The performance played with the audience's perception of when that performance began and where it might end. While the garments hung in unison at the installation site, the dancers were flocking across the campus toward the site where they would activate the work. In the end, the performance became a tapestry of all the participants and the sum of their contributions to the total work of art. But we need to figure out whether or not there are other succulencies of relation in other parts of the world and already at work in an underground manner that will suddenly open up other avenues and soon help to correct whatever simplifying ethnocentric exclusions may have arisen from such a perspective. Exactly a year before visiting Wendover, I visited Guatemala to work with Pishan, a Mayan group of weavers. In traveling through this resource-rich resource region of the world, where Spanish colonization subjugated the indigenous Mayan communities, I came to see my own relationship to the violence of colonialism. My ancestors are from the Philippines, which is a country that was also colonized by Portugal and Spain, and later occupied by the US. And I was standing on top of a volcano at the edge of Lake Aititlan when I felt this kind of earth energy waking me up in an aha moment of clarity. Maybe it was the present me acknowledging the future me or the past me leaving the present me to make room for the future me. The Highland Support Project supports Pishan, a fair trade textile workshop in the Western Highlands of Guatemala. Pishan, meaning spirit in the Mayan language of Quiche, is an association of indigenous artisan weavers, expert in the ancient techniques of backstrap and floor loom weaving and embroidery. I was tasked with helping develop new designs with locally made, uh, locally available materials and nascent techniques that could diversify their portfolio of production and hopefully attract more work and economic stimulation. We sourced materials locally and visited the homes of skilled weavers, dyers, and knitters to learn about their capabilities. While I was there, I also witnessed an entire village of people co come together at the community center where we were working to express their gratitude to the organizers and share their stories. Together, we created nine rug designs, 12 fabrics, and 10 garments we developed over the course over two weeks. We invited Paula Sepp, the head weaver of Pishan, to visit Virginia Commonwealth University and exchange knowledge about the commonalities and differences between our cultural textile practices. We learned how backstrap looms are used to make pot, pattern cloth, used to make whipil, and other garments, which reflect Mayan environment and cosmological symbolism. The work for ancestral offerings emerged amidst these encounters. The textiles tell the stories of my paternal grandmother and how her mother gave her away, and how she in turn gave my father away, and how these mothers returned and then turned away again. 
On the left is she came and then she left. And on the right is nearby is a waterfall from where we can jump into the water. These pieces incorporate knots, which have a surface, which look like they are weeping. The one on the left is, I, he I heard her outside crying, and on the right, tears and vespers for Petra Kanyenta. There were also a series of garments that were parts of other ongoing collaborations that hung with the textiles so they wouldn't get lonely or forget that they weren't without relation. Here's more images of the garments. These four pieces were woven by Pashan and are titled Complicit Forms. The images are graphic topologies of garments translated through the technique and hands of the weavers, and they're like non-lingual stories passed through gesture and touch. The borders of the frames were formed by an epoxy clay, which is an oil-based product that dries into stone. There were also two sculptures, one made of rayon ra raffia knots that would welcome you at the end of the space and bid you farewell as you left. And then this hat which sat on a giant table which held the middle of the space like an altar and was a collaboration with Ignatius Hats, a milliner in Petersburg, Virginia. The interpretive commons for embodied textiles is a non-conceptual imaginary entity it enables me to contextualize my material-based work in adjacency to the institution. During a residency at the Oak Springs Garden Foundation in Upperville, Virginia, I was looking for an encounter of a kind of archive of absence. The foundation was set up by Rachel Bunny Mellon, a lifelong gardener and the wife of former Secretary of Treasury, Andrew Mellon. She was also the heiress to Listerine. She wore clothing by Balenciaga and after he passed away, became a patron of his protege, Givenchy. As a dear friend of Jacqueline Kennedy, she was invited to design the Rose Garden at the White House. The crown of the estate is Bunny's library, which houses her collection of original, rare, hand-illuminated botanical books, the kind commissioned by monarchs as demonstration of the reach of their colonial rule. The estate is absolutely sprawling and is marked by signature melon low stone walls that border all of the roads. And as I moved about the property, I, could, I couldn't help but feel all the bodies who worked on this land to make the world possible for the melons. And it made me think about the land and the land itself too, but also Bunny engaged in an endless taming of the wild earth. And I was thinking about labor and the labor of the academics finding ways to engage with the residency, the labor of the people who tended to the land, the labor of the earth to produce food and material. And I wanted to make work about it. I wanted to point to the unseen and imperceptible work that goes on beneath the veil of power and wealth. I ended up meeting a painter named Alvin who worked in the maintenance shops he pointed out that he was wearing all white because he was a painter and not a milkman. We talked about art and about how being a skilled painter was also art. I asked him if I could collect some of the broken glass from a bucket in the shop and he helped me break it up into smaller pieces and told me I should present them on top of a bed of sand. All of these materials were scavenged on the property, pieces of rock or metal that I found on the grounds, pieces that told a story of the place. In the end, I wanted to offer this gesture of abstract labor back as a kind of acknowledgement that they were seen. My solo exhibition at the Alice in Seattle was curated by Julia Hynexias. This piece is titled Prayers for Estella Crudo. It's a tapestry woven textile made of torn muslin strips and thousands of knotted ends of synthetic rayon raffia on a linen warp. It hangs off the wall from a steel armature. Shown alongside is a video of Becoming Prayers, which is a performance of moving into it, and then in it, and then out of it. Unnamed and unspoken is a hand-woven, hand-knotted textile in synthetic, in synthetic rayon raffia on resist-dyed linen warp with cotton muslin weft. The mylar grid on the far wall is titled 
diagrammatic portal towards embody embodied knowledge in collaboration with Julia Hynexias. It's a site-specific woven mylar grid, eight foot by seven foot. This is a circular garment titled Nothing in No Place. It's hand-woven, double-leaf construction, circular-shaped garment in cotton, wool, rayon, and linen on an armature of burnt wood and blackened steel. Unassembled in pieces, hand-woven, hand-knotted textile in synthetic rayon raffia on warp-resist dyed linen, cotton muslin weft, cement, steel, epoxy clay, cotton muslin sandbag. The merging zero of oneness, burnt wood, black and steel. Tomorrow Asteroid is a collaboration with my husband, Lap Lay. Lap is a graphic designer and writer. Together, we wanted to create a platform for collaboration and to reach a broader audience. It's a way for us to collaborate and become productive outside of and be productive outside of our individual conceptual concerns. From our, our first project is a co small collection of garments that we sold at the family goods event coordinated by Lap's sister, Dan Lay. Dan is an art director for Network, an influencer platform. These are some images from the first samples. Dan produced and saw the shoot, Brittany Jones modeled, and Rob Liggins photographed. This is a close-up of a caftan robe that was rust printed and dyed in black tea with an iron modifier. This was dyed at Pine Meadow Ranch in Sisters, Oregon, and was just in a show at Pendleton Art Center in Pendleton. The patterns for these garments were made while I was at Oregon College of Art and Craft and slowly developed in Los Angeles after I gave birth to my son, Ido. These pants were also made at Pine Meadow Ranch and Sisters, and the black and white print was hand printed at Oregon College of Art and Craft. This print is a scan of one of my hand woven textiles, then hand screen printed onto muslin. The same process was used for this top. And so here's a picture from our setup at the Family Goods, and we have another one scheduled for December. So if you're in LA, come check us out. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Let's do some Q and A. Great. Um, any questions, curiosities, anything out there that you want to hear from Jean or have a question you're curious about um, her answer? I've got a microphone. I'll walk around and pass it off. your work uh, design, art, or craft? <laughs> Is my work design, art, or craft? Well, I've never considered myself a designer. I don't consider myself a designer. Um, I try to engage in design, but I can never call myself a designer. Um, I am an artist, um, and I engage in craft. Um, and I would say that my practice is a craft-based practice. So you um, mentioned that you created the like textile garments for showing interiority of them. Um, it was one of the very first ones. And I just wanted to hear more about you pursuing the idea of interiority, pursuing the idea of interiority with um, textiles. Mm -hmm. Kind of open-ended. That's a really good question. Um, so the process of, of textile is, um, allows for the interior processes to enact themselves. Um, one of the, you know, one of the, the things that I, I'm doing right now is, is, 
in the class that I'm the opacity course that I'm participating in with Aaron at Concordia, um, you know, while the while the lecture and, and discussion is happening, um, I'll be weaving and um, you know, sort of like organizing my material and 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 counting and listening and and this kind of like the the work with the hands opens opens my mind to the listening. And I'm able to sort of understand better than if I am to take notes somehow, right? It's, 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 it's a different kind of understanding. Um, and so through making, I'm able to process a lot of, um, a lot of my experience and what's going on around me. Um, and so with garment, garment is really like creating these, these spaces for my body and, and creating spaces of exploration. And um, it's really by understanding the space itself, there's one experience. But then to look upon it happening sort of outside of the process reveals to me sort of like the, the other things that I'm thinking about, right? Um, and so I'm still trying to find the language for it, right? It's like the, 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 the languaging is, is quite difficult because sometimes it's just the happening and the experiencing. Um, and so, but, but what I realize is from the doing, there's an understanding, and then from the looking back, there's an even more revealing. Thank you. Thank you. I, some of the images that struck me the most were these, relation, these relationships between um, hands and dust. So in the early performance, the sort of um, crumbling of the dirt from the performance site or the pushing, pushing of it away and then it became airborne. And your mention of the Great Salt, salt Lake, the possibility of it becoming dust and I'm wondering if um, as as someone who doesn't work with fiber something that has always um, made my mind go haywire because of its complexity is the structure inherent in fiber and weaving and I'm wondering if um, the relationship, like, is there something um, that is coming up for you as you're studying these relational texts that has, um, I just want to know your thoughts on structure and also dust, <laughs> structurelessness. I don't know, is that, that's random. There you go. <laughs> Um, such a good question. Um, so, there's two references that come to mind. One is um, the formlessness exhibition that was curated by um, Yves Alain Bois and Rosalind Krauss. And then the other one is um, Cyclonopedia by Reza Garistani. And so it's this, you know, this idea of like sort of like um, collaborating with formlessness, this idea of provisionality and a complicity with the earth. Um, and 
so much of my like material de- my material decisions come from the alive quality of the materials and most of my, all of my materials come from the earth whether they're natural materials that might come from animal fiber or plant fiber and then somehow when you work with them they behave like their sources um or they come from the earth like a epoxy clay, which eventually will turn back into the petroleum goo that it came from, right? Um, And so the materials are all provisional in a sense, right? In the sense of like Smithson's provisionality of the non-site, that they come to sort of represent um, the sort of place and time that we're working in, they become tools or materials for me to think about, but in the end, they will all be, go back to where they came from. And so it's um, a bit of a problem, right, <laughs> as an artist to constantly pr- producing, but also to be complicit with, like, the, um, with the process of entropy and to know that it's what's the point of of making but the making is the thinking and so it's not about the product itself or the production of the discrete object it's about the engagement with the um the environment and the community around me and creating and enabling an ecology which supports encounters with people and with the world um and so the materials are in a sense the same the same thing as as me right and and there's no separation between myself and the and the material but they help but they're tools of of thinking and so i think i did, did that <laughs> answer your question i'm not sure <laughs> Did that answer your question? Do you need the mic back? Okay. (laughs) How does textile arrive to embodiments and is facilitation required or needed for that arrival? Um, how, so the question is, how does textile arrive at embodiment? And what is the facilitation needed is, for that is to there occur? Is there a facilitation? Needed or required? Um, so textile for me is an embodied practice Um, because it is the process of the thinking and the feeling that is happening as this textile is becoming. The organization of the material, when you're, if, if you've ever woven cloth, right, you touch every single fiber of the material as you're organizing it. And you take one line of thread and you're counting and measuring space and then going back across that space. And sometimes hundreds and hundreds of times. So there's a lot of space and a lot of time for feelings to emerge and for like bodily senses to emerge. And so all of that goes into the work. And that's, for me, why a textile is textual, because it's an embodiment of all of those feelings and senses that go into the organization of how it is. Um, And when you get those errant threads or holes or breaks, those are also moments that and encounters with the thoughts and the feelings that are happening at the same time. And so the facilitation 
is the body itself, is the movement itself. It's the, it's the me worlding the textile, making it become. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you so much uh, for your talk. Um, and I, I've been trying to form this question since you ended your, uh, your, your talk and, and hearing people's questions has helped me articulate it. Um, I'm curious, uh, I, I so enjoy the way in which you weave together um, the sort of research-based practice and the, um, the richness and the complexity of your textual references. Um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how you explore um, the uh, sort of academic research, you know, the, the texts you're reading, um, and is there sort of, like, what is the reciprocity between this research and the work in the studio and the embodiment of feeling? Does one sometimes come first, um, or is there sometimes uh, a, a response or questions that come up in the work that you then seek out answers in text? Um, simply sort of, what, if you could navigate a little bit or share how you navigate um, the sort of the, the text and the textile <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, the embodiment and, and those relationships. So um, when it comes to reading, reading's really, really difficult for me. I do it very, very slowly and there has to be like a lot of things happening while I'm reading. I'm, I'll sit down and then I'll get up and make a pot of coffee and then I'll sit down and I'll open the book and I'll kind of <laughs> look for where I want to start and then I'll get up and um, maybe like adjust the temperature and open a window, maybe um, turn on the light on my oven <laughs> and come back and try to read a bit more. So it's really a very difficult and slow <laughs> process. Um, and I can't do it without, um, without help from other thinkers to interpret um, to interpret texts. So, um, so I have to, in order to engage with a text, engage with a community. Um, and um, the, this, the engaging with a text creates a context for the work, a reference point. Um, because I recognize, the only way that I can recognize the processes in my work is through understanding them through these texts. Because in the, as the processes are happening, I can feel them and I can know them and I can understand how they're working, but I can't language them. And through the text, I'm able to put words and identify um, what those processes and functions that are, are actually happening and how they are indeed extending. Um, it's like a, um, the, the texts bring a legibility to the work itself. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's, uh, I, it's just the beginning as well for me, is, is just the beginning of starting to um, really embrace, um, embrace the kind of scholarly inquiry alongside um, in, in proximity to my making process. And so yeah, it can be very consuming to, get, to fall into all making or all um, reading and writing. Um, and, and it takes different sides of the brain, too. So it's very difficult to switch back and forth. Um, but I'm trying to find ways, like right now, where I can listen to text and also work. And so then um, it seems to be a really productive way of working. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could you talk a bit more about sort of the cultural exchange, no, okay, uh, the cultural exchange that you were sort of alluding to with uh, the um, 
the, the, the weaving with the, uh, the Mayan group in Guadalupe. Uh, not Gua sorry. Um, uh, in Guatemala. Um, and yeah, just like, uh, I guess talk a bit more of like, what was that like, um, both in Guatemala and then in, um, I believe it was in Virginia. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so while I was doing my Fountainhead Fellowship in Virginia, um, at Virginia Commonwealth University, um, Highland Support project was based out of Richmond as well and they reached out to me um, because they support Pashan, the Pashan weavers. And so they were really looking to open up a cultural exchange between the fiber department and the weavers in Guatemala. And so um, we started meeting for, for several months just to talk about um, the cultural sensitivities of um, of of being from the U.S. and to to go to an into an indigenous community and um, you know to sort of um, to be sensitive to their their lifestyle. So um, I I engaged in cultural training for mm, four to six months, and then um, and then in January I went um, to to meet with them and. Um, it's it's com it's complicated, right? The, um, there's all sorts of um, language barriers, cultural barriers, um, distance says to travel across um, to to be with each other, um, and then when you're there, um, navigating where to find materials, how to you know what are the um, what are the capabilities and the techniques and the tools that we have, and and sometimes the tools are very um, provisional. And so, um, you know, we had to figure out all those things in order to um, find ways to collaborate. And so it was, um, it was challenging and also, but also really enriching and exciting. And um, I made um, some really lovely friends while I was there. Um, and it was crazy actually because um, in LA, I um, took a job for about a year and a half working in a, a textile showroom at the Pacific Design Center. And I was selling um, handmade rugs. And I walked into work one day, and we shared the, the, shared the showroom with um, the textile division of the company. And on the table was one of the textiles that I designed with, with the weavers. And it, um, the design had been picked up by a um, designer from the UK. and she bought the design and, and was running a production of it. And I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> like, this is a sign. Um, and so it means that it worked, right? They were able to take that and, and, and sell it and, and make money from it. And hopefully, you know, we're able to bring it back to, for infrastructure for their communities, like irrigation or, um, you know, um, building homes or, or ovens for, for their houses. So. Um, yes, so um, not only was it about me going there, but it was also about um, bringing the weavers into the classroom too, so that the students could um, could meet, um, you know, um, to encounter encounter their culture and also um, learn um, different techniques. Um, so yeah, it was really um, an exciting project and I'm, I'm still looking to engage in these um, kinds of projects uh, from the West Coast and um, yeah. Um, I'm really interested in how the production and presentation of your works appears to act as a feedback loop um, and I'm intrigued by the um, choreographed passages that relate to the act of weaving. Could you talk more about that? Um, so um, I think that working with um, working with dancers and choreographers 
uh, at the time was a way for me to um, explore collaboration, but also see how the textiles could live through another one's interpretation. And so um, it was from that interaction that I could also understand the, the why it was important to engage with a broader, um, broader group of people outside of the studio, especially, um, especially with these particular works. So um, I think at the time it was more about extending beyond the walls of a, a solitary practice. Um, now it's a little bit, I think, a little bit more complicated where it's a, in order to realize the full vision of the work, um, I need more sensing bodies. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but, um, but it started with um, a desire for connection and now it's like, it needs the connection. <laughs> Thank you. There's one, if there's one more question, the audience will take it. Otherwise, we'll thank John. Thank John. Our microphone's also a little glitchy, <laughs> glitchy, glitchy. <laughs> One more? Yeah. Might work and it might not. Hopefully this works. If not, I can just stand up and yell. Um, I, this question's not fully formed at the moment, but I'm really intrigued by the videos that you showed. And so I'm kind of curious about like what your collaboration with that, that format and that medium is when it comes to textiles and dancers and other aspects of your practice. Um, and what's that like and kind of how do you go about approaching that? Um, so the exploration with video at first, it was like not really, not really knowing whether it was about like documentation, something more narrative or something more like um, performative. Um, and so, um, but it stemmed out of a question of how do you show textile as something temporal, right? Because you can never, like a textile for me is never just a textile and you can never know it fully by just seeing it on a wall um, or in a static kind of scenario and so the the mediation through video is um i feel like in, intrinsic to dem demonstrating the work or for allowing the work to be um to actively express itself so that a viewer can fully not fully because you can never fully experience it i guess um but um see more of it and um um yeah, and I think that you know, um, there's it can live in more of like um, a, a, medi a mediated narrative format, like in the um, uh, daylight savings project video, or it can be more of something like um, a documentation of um, that's then further manipulated or mediated, like the the knot sort of felt knot um, piece, um, or it can be just like purely. Um, like a like non mediated non conceptual documentation like in the becoming prayers which is just like a straightforward sort of um, uh, objective sort of viewpoint. Thank you so much, Jean. Thank you, Sarah, for having me. Thanks so much for coming tonight.